Hi and welcome. Today I want to talk to you about something that is known as big data. It's not a very lucky term. I personally uh, don't like this term a lot, even though my name is a researcher uh, over the years got very associated with this term. But for everything that concerns the social sciences, uh, understanding society and how it's used in society, uh, this phenomena, you might as well replace this term with digital footprint that explains much better what this is about and, and we will talk more about this today. So in order to study society with this digital footprint in order to do our social scientific methods, that is probably the first step because in a computational scientific paradigm, uh, this digital footprint gives us the empirical evidence. Right? It's kind of like the observation of society through digital means. And then we also have the analytical part and we have the theoretical part uh, of our uh, computational scientific methods. But today we will only focus on this first part, on, on the big data part, on the empirical, on the empirical lag of this, of this scientific enterprise. And we will do that by answering three questions. First, we will ask very important question, what is big data? And I will give you a bunch of characteristics that help you to understand a little bit better what this is actually about. Second of all, what are the opportunities? How do companies and governments nowadays make use of this digital footprint? And I will run you through a bunch of, of case studies, which I think is the best way to explain you um, what are the opportunities here. And last but not least, any in innovation is, is never inherently good or bad. So there are also limitations and even threats to you making use of this digital footprint. And we will have to talk about that as well. All right, so what is big data? I said as a first thing, you can might as well replace the term with digital footprint. This is basically the digital footprint we leave behind with, with every digital step we take. Inevitably, when you do something uh, on a computer, on a cell phone, digitally, this information is transferred into zeros and ones and, and then transmitted over a fiber optic cable uh, or through the air, through radio waves or stored on a hard disk. But these zero and ones are necessarily there. They are stored. You leave a footprint behind. And uh, this is often unintentional that you leave that behind automatically. You don't, you don't actually collect actively data in order to obtain the digital footprint. It is already produced. It's kind of like a side effect that you have. right? Second of all, since it's a digital footprint it, and since you don't make a conscious effort of, of really an intentional effort of co collecting it, it is often very messy and incomplete. So not everybody is, is on Facebook um, and not everybody is on Twitter. But may, maybe then you will have a mobile phone uh, or you will have a credit card, kind of like somehow we're going to get you, right? That's the idea. And that's what then a data analyst call data fusion. So we take different aspects of this really messy digital footprint that we leave behind and kind of like stitch it together. And somehow we're going to get a more and more complete picture of what's going on. Data fusion, that's called. Third, there is no sampling, as I already mentioned. We don't go, like in traditional uh, scientific empirical work, we would go out and, and make a survey right, and, and ask people. But here we don't really make a survey. We don't go, go to do data collection because the data is already collected. And then we just take a recording. And these recordings can be extremely big. For example, there are two out of seven people on this planet are on Facebook. I mean, that's a very big uh, footprint. And then I work, I can, theoretically, if I, if I would have access to, I could work with all Facebook users, with 2 billion Facebook users. Now, it's big, but it's still biased. Facebook users are not all people on planet Earth. They're two out of seven, 
But that's not all. There might be a bias in that. I mean, Facebook users have certain characteristics. For example, the elderly might not be well represented on Facebook, right? So we have to be aware that the idea of random sampling, it is was traditionally done in the scientific enterprise, was to take a random sample. And this random sample would then, by pure chance of luck of being random, kind of like represent you know, the entire population in a very representative, nice way, unbiased way, right? Sometimes you would have to have different sampling techniques and there are techniques about it. Um, but that was the idea, to sample randomly and with that get a representative uh, data uh, sample of, of the population. However, when I work with a digital footprint, this is not the case. I work with maybe a big, but always still a biased sample. Fourth, often this digital footprint is produced in real time. This is not necessarily always the case. And these characteristics as well that you see here, it doesn't mean like if all of them are fulfilled, that's what's called big data. It's not, it's not really like this. I just give you some characteristics that give you, give you an idea. But often a benefit of working with the digital footprint is that it's produced in real time and that you can analyze it in real time. And we see some examples of how that is done. And fifth, machine learning. And machine learning actually what nowadays uh, actually guides the artificial intelligence discussion uh, only became really viable and beneficial thanks to this massive digital footprint that we leave behind. Uh, before it was actually we had more a rules-based approach to artificial intelligence and with the digital footprint we just threw massive data on it, and the machines out of these massive data uh, bases were able to detect patterns and learn from them. So machine learning is an inherent part of big data. Actually, the real term should be big data analytics, because the analytics part is so important. It's not really about the data, it's what you make of them. And the only way you can fight fire is with fire. You, know, you have to fight fire with fire, because this digital information overload that comes to us, we, like this processor cannot really process this, this biological processor. So we need machines in, her, in order to, for us to help us to make sense of this digital footprint. Sometimes uh, these characteristics, uh, if, you, if, you, if you go to the private sector, they're called the three V's or the four V's. For example, the digital footprint has to do with veracity. I mean, there's just, it's a footprint. Uh, the data fusion has to do with variety, variety of data. So for example, you can have text, but you can complement it with images, with sounds, with videos, with different sources, as I say, and combine them, credit card with social media data and so forth. The volume, it's really big. I mean, there's no sample. I work actually with the entire population. That's the idea of this no sampling, right? That I work with, not with a sample of social media users. I just work with all of them. But, but they might not really represent the entire population of the entire world, but they represent all Facebook users, to continue with that example. And the velocity in real time. So veracity, variety, volume, velocity, the four Vs, maybe there are five Vs. I didn't come up with a V yet for machine learning. So if you have an idea, uh, very welcome. Not so good and not so good in this business of coming up with words with the same letter. But that's kind of like the idea. So these are the characteristics I go through. As I said, uh, it's not obligatory for big data to have all of them, but it gives you an idea what this paradigm is actually about. So the first example I want to run you through is actually from international development. It comes from Colombia. And right now, the global development agenda is guided by something called the Sustainable Development Goals, where all 200 governments of the world came together and put forth some goals. So for example, goal 2.4 says, ensure sustainable food production system and implement resilient agricultural practices that increase productivity. All right, that's a, that's a very important goal for humankind. Uh, how could we implement that? How could we ensure sustainable food productions and increase agricultural productivity? Well, with data. So with data, we can do that, right? So here is an example of how, uh, how this has been done. Some engineers here took weather data and weather data is, is redundantly available from NASA or something. You can look it up on the internet, right? Very fine-grained uh, and, and, and very localized 
uh, and very in real time. And they combined it with rice crops data that they had available in Colombia. And they threw that into an algorithm. Turns out this algorithm was from neuroscience, from biology, but doesn't really matter uh, where you get your algorithm from. This algorithm fit and, and was able to analyze this data very well in order to understand better climate change. Many developing countries are struggling a lot with climate change and it impacts the agricultural production. Well, many developed countries as well, not only developing countries, uh, both of them are struggling with climate change. So that's a very important dynamic to understand. And the results were extremely localized, were extremely fine-grained. For example, in a town called Saldania, they found that the problem was the solar ra radiation during the grain ripening stage. And in another town called Espinal, they found out that the problem uh, for uh, rice production was the sensitivity to warm nights. Now, when you have this information, you can act on it, right? That's kind of like what Confucius said, if you want to help somebody getting out of poverty, don't give them a fish. Teach them how to fish. And with this information, that's kind of like uh, the fishing rod, right? You have now information and you can pull yourself out of poverty because you can actually act on it. You know the sensitivity to warm nights is the problem here and you can act on it. What actually happened is a low cost solution. Um, and the 170 farmers that were informed with this information were able to save $3.6 million and triple the productivity from one ton per hectare to three tons per hectare. That means they also tripled their income, more or less, right? And that, that really gets you out of poverty, right? So how do you get out of poverty here? Well, with pure information, by making use of the digital footprint, analyzing it, and producing, producing insights. Here's another example in, uh, from a company in Uruguay that I've been working with, uh, Okaratech. And this company, basically what it does, it uses the digital footprint and also, order to, uh, also in order to inform farmers and other companies, fertilizer companies, and so forth. So what they work with, first step that they work with is with Google Earth. That's, that's a, a service that's, that's, that's available also uh, for you and for everybody. Uh, informed by satellite images. That's how Google Oil works. And then they put these layers on top. These layers were basically, also they, they don't produce any data for themselves. They basically uh, collect uh, this data, procure this data, and then provide it. So for example here, there's the level of biomass, the nutrients in the soil, the kind of soil, the level of potassium, the level of nitrogen, uh, the fertilizers that are in the soil already, what has been planted before in this kind of soil. So instead of the farmer kind of like having a vague memory or, or, or maybe just like thinking like, I, I think here I should plant corn and here I should plant wheat. Now the farmer is able to do an analysis, right? A massive analysis with that. And then, so this, this is often collected. Actually, this data either exists or it's collected, for example, by drones uh, or, or by satellite images and so forth. And then these different layers, one on top of each other, give you a very complete picture of actually what's going on. So instead of just knowing, well, this is pretty good earth and this is not so good earth, or this is earth good for this corn and this is earth good for wheat. Now, we have a very fine-grained picture of actually what's going on um, in the earth, in the, in the different little uh, uh, parcels of this farmland and can optimize our agricultural production. Now, we even want to go more fine grain. So the idea now in the next step is we don't go by the square yard, for example, uh, that we can look at with our satellites, with our drones. We actually go by plant. So these are robots here that basically then work in the field and actually look at the different plants and start to water the plant according to what this particular plant needs. So this plant, uh, or give it nutrients, fertilizers. So this plant might say, well, I need some potassium. Uh, my pH levels are not okay. I need some nitrogen. Uh, water, water, actually, I'm fine. And then this robot, in an automated way, basically, uh, provides this plant with what it needs. It's one-to-one -one customer relationship marketing, you might, you might call it, right? Customer relationship management, <laughs> as we would call it in, in the business world. So, but it, with the difference, the, the consumer is a plant, right? So if you go back to our five characteristics, that example kind of like 
it brings all these five characters together. First of all, we have a digital footprint. For example, we have satellite images here from Google Earth. Second of all, there is no sampling. We are going for all the plants, right? We don't go like, oh, we look at, I don't know, 100 plants out of these 10,000 plants and have an idea uh, what these plants need. No. We go for all the plants. There is no sampling. We go with the entire population, actually. Third data fusion, we take data from different inputs. So we take the data from Google Earth that comes kind of like for free from us because Google produced it, the salad images. We take data from drones. We take data from the robots locally and kind of like patch it all together in order to get a more complete understanding of the Earth beneath, of the weather patterns, and of what this plant actually uh, wants and needs. And uh, this is produced in real time. I can act on it in real time. No plant has to suffer, right? We can go right away and act on it. And we use, of course, a lot of machine learning to make sense of it. As I said, this biological processor couldn't handle all this data. I mean, how could you take care of tens of thousands of plants, right? You couldn't, but for machines, it's actually no problem. It looks for patterns, it looks for similarity, then also can also make predictions. If these plants need that, then probably these plants need that and can optimize, optimize the production. So, and that really increases food production. Like it helps us, it helps us to feed the world, right? Um, and it helps us to make this world a better place. How? Well, the input that we have here is basically data, right? More data. So let's walk through each one of these five characteristics one by one with some very concrete example. Let's start with the digital footprint. Uh, this idea that the data is automatically recorded, often often unintentionally, more like a side effect uh, that comes with it. For example, here what you see is when somebody on Twitter says, good morning, or buenos dias, guten morgen, buongiorno, right? You see where there is connectivity, and we will have to talk about that because there's the digital divide as well, but where there is connectivity, um, we just have this data. It's, it, nobody spent money here in order to make a survey about this data. It's, it's just, uh, it is there. And we can find already very interesting insights. For example, we can see from this study what we found is that people who live on the East Coast, actually, they do get up more early than we here in California on the West Coast. And that's not because of the time change. They re like we really do sleep in a little bit more here on the West Coast, right? So if you would have gone before and said, like, I want to study this. Can you give me, I don't know, a million dollars to study this? People would have said, are you crazy? But now we can do these kind of studies and we learn something about society that we would not have learned before thanks to this automatically recorded digital footprint that we all leave behind with every digital step we take. If you have Google Maps on your phone, uh, or, or use Gmail and, and, and did not really go through all these privacy settings. Remember these things that you usually actually never look at uh, and often you scroll down and then accept the terms. So if you didn't do that and, and opted out of it, you can go to this web page here on Google Maps and the location history and you can actually see where you have been in each second of your life during the past year. So for example, this was the last year. Uh, that's where I've been or the last two years where I've been uh, all over the world. And uh, then you can also look at specific dates. For example, on November 14th, of Monday, November 14th, 2014, uh, it seems like, so this is Davis, right? So it seems like I was all over Davis. I have no idea what I did. Okay, so here's campus. Okay, so it's Monday, I went to work. Now here, it seems like I was at the farmer's market. There's no farmer's market on Monday. And, uh, and then I went downtown. I usually often go there like for restaurants and for bars, but it's a Monday. Why would I go to a I, I have no idea. And then I went to, uh, to North Day. So uh, I don't remember, but the digital footprint remembers, right? And you can actually also play a little video, video and see where you have been at what, what point in time. Uh, just in case, uh, if you're not absolutely sure, don't share this trick with your significant other. <laughs> it can lead to some very interesting discussions. All right? So that's the idea of the digital footprint. We really actually leave it behind. We leave it also for these companies then uh, in order to study it and provide better services. And for us ourselves, like in this case, Google lets us see our digital footprint. 
So what companies do then, for example, mobile phone operators, they actually become data provider nowadays, right? Your mobile phone operator might go and sell this data. So for example, only with what they call metadata, so metadata is data about data. For example, in your cell phone, the call duration and the call frequency, right? So how long you make a call and with what frequency. That would be metadata because we're not interested who you call, we're not interested what you say, right? It's more like data about the phone call. And the mobile phone operator inevitably has to collect that because that's how the mobile phone operator bills you, right? Often in your bill, actually, in the appendix of your bill, you can actually see how often you could, I mean, they, they take out the, 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 the complete number that you may be called, maybe sometimes even in there. They don't record what you say, but they have to record how often and with what frequency you call. If you just use this metadata, you can basically reverse engineer an entire census, a, a household survey of an entire country with an accuracy up to 85%. For example, you can predict all kinds of socioeconomic uh, data, for example, your income level, uh, your educational level, for example. You can predict demographic, your age, your gender, and other behavioral traits. So especially in many developing countries where we didn't do a census, or also here in the United States, we do a census every 10 years usually in developing in developed countries as well. Now we have that in real time. We have in real time this kind of information derived from this digital footprint. And many mobile phone operators then actually now become also data providers. They become kind of like data companies, right? Because once you have this digital footprint and, and you know this, you can provide useful services. For example, if you want to open a new shop in town, this kind of information is very useful because you know when which kind of people walk around and you know better if you have, for example, a shop for, for women's clothing or for men's clothing, you know exactly better where to locate it. And you might as well, you, you pay, I don't know, some money to this mobile phone operator in order to provide you with this data and you can optimize the location of your store. That's, fun, that's fantastic. So this data, this digital footprint is produced, we just provide it and then it is, it is analyzed and it is being used in order to optimize optimize, for example, business models, as we can see here. For the next two characteristics of, of, of big data, data fusion and the no sampling, the idea that we work with a variety of data and with big amounts of data, possibly with everything that's there, we just record the entire population, right? This idea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat them together because I'm going to walk you through two examples, recent example of the world of politics and how big data is used in politics, specifically in democracy, in representative democracy. So in the 2012 Obama campaign, the campaign made use of, of this already, of this, of this idea of working with the digital footprint. What they did is they spent a billion dollar, a thousand million dollar to hire a group of, of 40 engineers, well basically, uh, yeah, data nerds, they got them from Facebook, from Twitter, from Craigslist, two professional poker players, which are very good in, in combinatorics, a stem cell researcher, I think I remember, right? And they got these 40 and as the legend goes, they put them in a basement with a number to call the pizza service and gave them a billion dollars. <laughs> basically, well, it wasn't exactly like that. You can research more about, uh, about how that happened. But there was more money than the Obama campaign in 2012 spent on TV ads. You traditionally would always think in the United States, TV ads is the biggest expenditure and that's what wins the election. But no, they spent it already back then. They spent more on this, on this data management project. And what they did is the project was called Project Narwhal. They created 16 million unique voter profiles basically of, of, of the swing voters, right? The 16 million out of the, out of the 200 and something million voters in the United States. These are the ones that decide the election. And they use the idea of data fusion. Now, not from every one of these 16 millions, they had a complete profile. Because with the digital footprint, as I said, you never have a complete, it's not like you have all the rows and columns and everything is neatly filled. Like if you would do a survey, for example, you make sure you ask everybody all the questions and then your, your spreadsheet is complete. No, it, it, the digital footprint has always some missing rows, missing columns, missing cells in its database. So, uh, what they did is they completed it. As I said, somehow, somehow we're gonna get here. So they started with voter registration, um, for example, with with the telephone book, just with with, with simple things. But even when when further Facebook, Twitter data, 
and uh, even TV setup boxes. So these direct TV setup boxes, they had access to 20 million of them. And if I know that, I know what kind of shows you watch. And I can get a pretty complete picture of what your tendencies are, right? What channels you watch, what shows you watch, how often you watch TV. And I can derive a lot of socioeconomic, demographic data from that, but also political opinions. They ranked uh, the undecided voter on a persuasion profile, and they run a lot of com computer simulations of likely voter behavior. What they did then with that uh, is they got a lot of positive, positive outcomes. For example, they paid 35% less per broad broad uh, broadcast commercial than their opponents because they knew exactly where to put which kind of commercial. They knew their clientele, right? For example, DirecTV or, or, or uh, something, uh, something similar where you can actually put the broadcast on, they knew exactly on where, on which local TV station to put which kind of ad to affect which kind of voter. And on average, it saved them 35% of their TV uh, uh, broadcast com commercial budget as well. They were able to guide people that were on the streets, that went door to door, volunteers. They could get them exactly to the right people, right? They had a little app developed there. Email donations. They knew their people much better and they could raise much more email donations. They got their money basically back pretty quickly, this, this uh, investment. And they could do, this were the first, uh, first beginnings, it was not the first, but the first beginnings of using this idea of having tailor-made campaign promises. So in politics, that works extremely well because in politics, you know, every politician, let's say, has 40 campaign promises. Promises a lot of different things, right? Now, it might be that of these 40 campaign promises, in an extreme case, you disagree with 39 of them. But there might be one just by pure, like there's, there's one or probably usually, even if, if you don't like the candidate, more than one, five, six, seven, ten uh, of the campaign rules that you actually do agree with. I mean, we are not all like this. So uh, completely against or for. So there are some things, you know, and even if it's only one, so out of 40, 39 you disagree with, one you're going to agree with. Now, once we're able to identify that, for example, you might be for green energy, for sustainable development. Now, once we understand that, right, we can basically uh, make tailor-made campaign promises and basically show you the ones you agree with. Now, actually, what I would do is I wouldn't do that on Facebook, for example, on your Facebook tweet. I actually get one of your friends, one of your Facebook friends probably did like on the Obama campaign, right? And once they did like on the Obama campaign, uh, the Obama campaign has access to their Facebook feed. Yeah, you might not be aware, that's one of the things you probably never read, you know, again, you scroll through and then accept, so they have access to that. And then they start to post on your friend's Facebook feed. Um, they might not even post from the campaign, they might just post the New York Times articles, or Washington Post articles, or whatever, that talks about how Obama is the hero of green energy. And you will see that on your, phrase, on your friend's uh, Facebook feed, your friends will not see that. Your friend will not see it. We, we all see different feeds, right? So your friend might not even be aware that it's on there, but you see it. And it's tailored to you. So you know, on Facebook, you can also say who, who you target with, what kind of posts. So it's tailored to you. And then you see on your friend's Facebook uh, feed that Obama is the hero of green energy. Now you see that for one month, two months, three months. At the end, you see like, wow, and my friend posts all these, like, all these posts about Obama, the hero of green energy. That I, I am actually, I really, I really like green energy, right? So over some time, you start thinking, this Obama guy is not such a bad, it's not such a bad candidate, right? He completely agrees with me on the screen. And, and he did a lot of that. I, I see all my friends talk about it, right? It's kind of like this echo chamber effect that we then put on top of these filter bubbles, these actually technical terms uh, that have been developed based on these kind of practices. So the filter bubble is we filter, we create from the filter, the filter bubble idea is that we create for you just a bubble, a bubble in which you live. You only see the things that we want you to see. And the echo chambers that you then resonate with your friends and it goes back and forth and you basically hear an echo of what you already, already liked after you are in this filter bubble, after you got there through the filter bubble. So the echo chamber is the resonance that you then get from your friends. Um, and then after a while, you, you really start to being brainwashed. <laughs> That's what it is. It has nothing to do with democratic will formation, deliberate. It's, it's you're being brainwashed. That's basically what it is. It is 
it goes in the direction of an informational dictatorship. I mean, George Orwell, who, who started this, talking about the Big Brother in his novel called 1984, right? The Big Brother's watching you, it, it controls you. It's informational, it's informational control. What they did with that then, basically, they were able to change the voting behavior of almost 80% of the targeted undecided voter through Facebook. That has been reported, so it's 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 uh, it's a very high percentage, right? Eighty percent, and and some people say, well, that's how Obama won the two thousand twelve uh, campaign. Then, so this, of course, has been many several years ago, and 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 now these these ideas have been fine tuned. Of course, in the private sector as well, something similar happens when you shop on a retailer, for example, on Amazon or something else. You could tailor messages, right? So there have been many developments going into into this direction. One of them is that it has been started to be mixed with psychological profiles. And that was actually an unrelated study. The study had nothing to do with politics. It was a study done in the University of, of Cambridge by Kosinski and co-workers. And what they basically did, and often uh, that's how these big data studies are actually done, is they collected data combined with a survey. So often the digital footprint, if I wanted to use it for study purposes, it's combined with some kind of experiment or with some kind of survey, which helps me to see something that the digital footprint doesn't reveal. So what these researchers did is they put up uh, an app on Facebook that says, said something like, I don't remember, but says something like, know your personality in only a few minutes, in three or five minutes, right? Sponsored by the University of Cambridge. And you would be on Facebook, you know, being a little boy. So like, okay, great, what? University? I can know my personality just by filling out the survey. And it was a standard survey, like every company uses in the hiring process. You know, you, you, you answer a bunch of questions and these surveys are decades old. Uh, and then you detect your personality by answering these questions, right? They did that. So you filled out the surveys, and millions of people actually filled out the survey. Hundreds of thousands of people filled out the survey. And then, uh, well, once you accepted that, again, this thing you always scroll through and then click accept, the thing that you never read, the terms of uh, agreement. What you then also gave them, you gave them access to all your Facebook feed, all your historic Facebook feed. So what they had then was they knew your personality because you gave it to them through the survey, and they knew your Facebook feed. Now, what they did now is they trained a machine learning algorithm to see with how many Facebook likes could the machine learning algorithm detect your personality. So that's a training problem, right? You have a training set and a test set, and you train the algorithm. The algorithm just looks for patterns in your likes and sees how in these patterns uh, it can detect something. It doesn't even need to make a lot of sense to us uh, in, in a sensical way, but detect some pattern that can predict some of your personality traits. And that's what they did then, and it turned out that they could predict a lot, right? So with 100 to 300 Facebook likes, they can predict sexual orientation, ethnicity, religious and political views, personality traits, your level of intelligence, your level of happiness. If you use addictive substances, if your parents are separated, they were able to predict. And of course, age and gender, there's no way to hide. So with about, yes, yeah, so with actually with less than, uh, with, with 100, 150, they were able to detect your personality traits. That's what I was talking about, right? That was the main, main uh, idea of the study with, with the survey. They were able to detect your personality traits. Now, what they then also did is they asked uh, somebody from your family, your very close friend, your significant other, girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, or your parents, uh, to fill out a personality survey for you. So it's kind of like your mom filling out a survey for you, and she should know you pretty well, right? Or, or your spouse, uh, your husband, wife. And they filled out the survey for them, turned out with 200, 250 Facebook likes, the algorithm knew your personality better than your mom, right? And then at the end, they also said, so what about yourself? What do you think? What's your personality? How much introverted? How much extroverted are you? What's your openness? What's your level of conscientiousness, right? And then you said, well, I, I think I'm more like that. I mean, you know yourself. Right? Turns out with 300 Facebook likes, the algorithm knew you better than you yourself. 
right? <laughs> so that's how far this has come actually in order to make uh, these kind of predictions. Now, this study was done, was very successful. Uh, the, the, the professor who led the study actually then uh, left Cambridge and, and went to Stanford to continue, to continue his studies here in California. And um, a company in Cambridge picked that up, not related really to, uh, to, to this team of studies. As I said it wasn't even there in Cambridge anymore. And this, Cambridge, this company called Cambridge Analytica then basically took up this idea and said, well, in order if we do political marketing, uh, instead of just marketing to socio-demographic profiles, right? So we have sent this one message to women and this one message to men and different age groups. You might remember the term soccer moms. Have you ever heard that term? That actually came out of a political campaign uh, management uh, analysis. So uh, they analyzed credit card data and with the credit card data they discovered that well, there were some people that were very important for the election. They were important swing voters. But the data showed, the only thing that the data showed them that actually made sense is that they were all women and they were mothers and they bought like soccer equipment. So there were mothers who had kids uh, who went to soccer, right? So out of this, they invented this term soccer moms. And it became a very important term in political campaigning because the soccer moms are the ones who decided the election. So that's also, this came out of the idea of using sociodemographic data in order to already segment the society in order to spin messages. All right. um, and then the idea is to go beyond sociodemographic data and actually use psychological data. And here I show you a little video clip of the CAO of the company and what he had to say about that. In the 2016 presidential election, several uh, Republican candidates hired this company, Cambridge Analytica. First Ted Cruz, which was a candidate, and after Ted Cruz was out of the race, uh, the eventual winner, uh, Donald Trump as a candidate, the campaign hired, hired this company. And there was a big controversy of, of what they actually did, how much they used actually uh, psychological data, psychographics, right, in order to, to, to spin tailor-made messages. One thing that, uh, that was said, for example, during the third TV debate between Trump and Clinton, 175,000 different versions of Trump's argument were sent. Now, Trump didn't make 175,000 arguments, but different arguments. So it's just like, you know, if, if, if defending the Second Amendment was a statement, it would be sent uh, with a criminal to some psychological profile. and as a sports hunter to another psychological profile, right? And that really gets under your skin, right? If you play with people's fears. Because if you get into people's fears, I said before that that's brainwashing and that is really brain control, right? If you know what people are afraid of and you tailor it to that, yes, that, that really has nothing to do with democracy anymore. I, uh, I would say that is that's just a, an attempt of, of a top-down top down control, actually. And we really have to see what we do with our democracy in light of that. I mean, representative democracy, I would say, has to be reinvented. Uh, it is still based on some assumption, informational assumption that are 250 years old that don't apply anymore. And this digital transparency, this brutal transparency, kind of like broke the system. Uh, and there are several, it's a very deep debate. I unfortunately cannot go into it right now, but yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm very convinced that uh, representative democracy has to be reinvented, especially because of this digital footprint that basically revealed so much about us. And so the relationship between those that represent us and us has to be reevaluated and some safeguards institutions have to be put in place in order to make it work or use a completely different system in general in order to make democracy work. Now I told you the story as well because uh, there was this idea of no sampling because what Cambridge Analytica uh, claimed is that they actually made psychographic profiles of 200 million Americans. So that's now everybody. So while Obama did 16 million, just the swing voter, the idea is now let's do everybody. And you know, a database with two, 200 million rows, it's also not so big. It's a big database, but talking about big data, yes, that's what we're talking about. Actually, even a database with 7 billion, where you would have everybody on planet Earth, 
on it, yeah, it's doable. And, and people work with these kind, kind of databases. So that's the idea. Don't sample anymore. Don't do polls, exit polls, where you estimate what do people feel and you, no, just, just work with everybody. Just make a database of 200 million people. Use data fusion, stitch it together. Somehow we're gonna get you and something you're gonna be, right? And then work with the digital footprint, a complete digital footprint, data fusion based digital footprint where no sampling is requirement right, required because we work with the entire population. The next characteristic of big data is that it often is in real time. So the digital footprint is left behind in real time. As I said, it's not like if it's not in real time, it's not big data. No, these are just some characteristics to give you an idea of, of, of what this phenomenon is actually about. But big data is often fast, especially compared to traditional uh, research methods. For example, surveys will take a long time to collect, to process. So in this, I, in this sense, the digital footprint is very dynamic. It's very quickly available. And I will give you two examples. One more like a macro example, a very big example on the, on the level of nations and one of the level of the person, of, of a human person, a micro example. So one very important macroeconomic indicator is the inflation rate. So that's very important for all countries. Uh, so the idea is how much is money worth, right? Because if a gallon of milk costs a dollar or costs ten dollars, well, that makes a difference because what's actually worth is the gallon of milk, right? The other thing is just the green piece of paper that kind of like relates something to. So we have to see the relation between actually things that are really worth something uh, and this green piece of paper that we all put our trust in. So how is this inflation rate calculated? Uh, the Bureau, the U.S. Bureau of, of Labor Statistics has a staff of about uh, over 100 people and it sends it to 90 cities uh, to collect 80,000 prices. The cost of that operation per year is $250 million. That's well justified because the Fed and others, you know, when they do the interest rate adjustment that everybody is actually nervous about, that's also, it affects the inflation rate. So how much money we print. So $250 million, yeah, that's, it's expensive, but it's a very important, very important function of, of macroeconomic stability. Now, this company called Price Stats, they were 17 um, nerds, data, data scientists from MIT actually, instead of having 100 staff, a staff of 100, they were just 17. And they didn't go for 80,000 prices in, in, 90, in 90 cities. They went to over 300 online retailers in 70 countries, not cities, 70 countries, and measured the daily fluctuations of 5 million prices not 80,000, right? Uh, and yeah, so what's on the internet? I mean, what you sell and, and, and buy, what you can sell and buy on Amazon and on, uh, on eBay, that's actually the price and that affects the price that sets the price. So instead of going to a store and seeing how much does a gallon of milk cost, you might as well just look it up online. How much does a gallon of milk cost at the supermarkets? So that's what they actually did. And if you see the official statistics, so the official statistics is the blue line that's from the government, and you see the statistics from this company, which is the orange line, you can see that they match up very nicely. Actually, in, in many points, the, 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 the orange line is much more fine-grained. So while price adjustments take a month or two months or three months in order to process. I mean, these people have to come back from all these stores. We have to collect it, have to process it and publish it. And, and we don't do that in uh, continuously. We do that every few, few weeks or months. We collect these prices. You see the orange one is much more fine-grained, right? Yet in real time, it gives you basically these fluctuations. You can make anticipations. You can make much better predictions, anticipate some events, some turns, for example, much better. And it, it turns out that in, in all the countries they studied, uh, they, the, the, the data matched up extremely well and was actually more fine-grained. Except, oh, there was one exception. And that was in Argentina, a country that has long been struggling with inflation. And that's what they found, right? So the orange data is the data that they found from the digital footprint, the orange line. And the blue line is what the government reported. <laughs> the government reported like there's no, no price fluctuation, right? So now you have two alternatives. You can say, well, yeah, let's don't trust the internet. But actually, as I said, nowadays, what's in the internet? I mean, that's, that just will affect also the real world, the real world retailers, right? There's actually a term called uh, somebody got Amazoned. 
So, for example, if a company goes out of business, Barnes and Noble had to famously had to had to close many bookstores because they got Amazon. So actually, there is a real competition with what an online retailer does, what an offline retailer does, and and prices have to adjust. And what's in the internet is actually often driving the price. So you get a much better. So yes, what's in the internet? That's the price level, right? So the other alternative might be. Yeah, and uh, the, the 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 magazine, the Economist, then had this title page, which said, "Don't lie to me, Argentina." I don't know if you remember the song. It's it, it's it's originally "Don't cry for me, Argentina." Uh, yes, and 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 then the Economist and others now they don't use the the data anymore from the Argentinian government. They use digital footprint data. So we don't trust the, the traditionally official statistics reporters anymore, like even governments. We go with the digital footprint instead because it's extremely difficult to lie with the digital footprint. Like, it's impossible to manipulate the entire internet. Right. So that's an example of how we can in real time then monitor these kind of, uh, these kind of imp very important indicators. Let's do on a macro level, let's go to the micro level to the individual person. We can also do a lot of real time uh, analysis there. So if you call your favorite call center, your call center of choice, right, you usually hear the sentence, this call might be recorded for quality and training purposes. And you always think it's the head of human resources who listens in in order to make sure that you're treated well, right? Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> no, there would be a lot of calls the head of human resources would have, have to listen to. Um, it's often between about 10 million algorithms that actually these algorithms listen to you and classify your personality as you talk. And that's actually a very old technique that they're using that has been developed by a psychologist called Kahler, which was actually hired by NASA. Because NASA had this problem that if they would go to space, right, astronauts would have to be together in this capsule uh, for a long time. Uh, and and you, you take like your alpha males and two of them, the, 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 the ego-driven scientist and then the f jet fighter pilot and put these two together. I mean, yeah, these two big alpha egos up there, you know, you have to see somehow how they fit together. So in this very small space, they get along. The Russians, they, they had a, a space homicide almost once. I mean, these two guys, they were, they were getting in a conflict and on their daily blood measure that one takes from the other, right, the, the one put the needle and rammed so deep it got into the bone, it got infected, they had to return to Earth. Now, that's expensive. Right, that's extremely expensive. And eventually the Russians lost the space race, the human space race there. Right, so it was important during these times in, in the space race who gets first to the moon in order to, to get people together that actually would get along for, for such a long time in such a small area. So Carla, what actually he discovered is he would go to these meetings and they would do assessment centers and put the best jet fighter pilots and the best scientists together and, and see who gets along with whom, weeks of observation. Carla just went there, he looked at them, took some notes, and after 20 minutes he was done. And his predictions actually turn out to be better than the predictions of all the other psychologists who were in this assessment center. So they ask him, what are you doing? What are you doing in these trades? How can you so quickly predict people's personality and who gets along with whom? He said, well, I'm just observing how people talk. Not even what they talk, just how they talk. It's not even the words they use, just how they talk, right? And with that, you can very, very well predict the personality. And that's what these algorithms use. So this is a 50-year-old method that's been proven and proven. So uh, you cannot fake how, you can't fake even what you say, but how you say things, it's extremely difficult to fake. So, and, and from, so when you talk on your call center, the algorithms go in, use this very traditional method, and then they put you in different kind uh, of personality boxes. So for example, what drives you? Are you emotions driven? 30% most people in society are emotions driven. Are your thoughts driven? Driven by reactions, opinion, reflections, or actions. So for example, one person might be driven by actions. Uh, this person just wants, wants a coupon. This person didn't have the mobile phone for like two days and, and needs a coupon. Right, so yeah, then customer satisfaction, give, give him the coupon, you won't get around. This person is not satisfied, is, is really driven only by real actions. Whereas another person, emotions driven person, maybe just wants to cry. You know, just say, I, I just want to let you know how, how difficult it was. Like, really, it's been, I just need to be understood. It's been difficult two days 
without a mobile phone and the doctor's appointment, the things and the kids and whatever. It's been really, oh yeah, no, I do understand. Oh, that was really hard. Like, unfortunately, we cannot do anything for you, but oh no. Oh yeah, that makes me feel good that you understand me, right? They're very happy customers. So what actually happens if you then match up somebody that has your personality and what happens then like on the other side of the call center, you have to imagine, as you can see here, there are people also with personalities. So what actually these algorithms do is once they know your personality, and if you call back, they know your number, they already know your personality, they match it up with the personality of, on the side of the call center and match you up with people that have your same personality. End of story of matching it up with somebody has the same personality is it's the average call duration is cut by half from 10 minutes down to five minutes because they understand each other much quicker. They don't talk beside each other. They're like on the same wavelength, right? And the customer satisfaction get, gets double, doubled, right? So tell that to any business, business person. Right? <laughs> average call duration, productivity gets doubled, average call duration gets cut by half. And customer satisfaction, what you get out of it, gets doubled as well. Like, that's incredible, right? And how is it done? Well, again, by, by this kind of data anal analysis. Now, the last time I talked with this company, they said about a third to a half of call centers are using that. By the way, the people in the call center on the other side, they have no idea that this, often they have no idea that this is happening. I mean, they've been just talking, the, the algorithm has been analyzing them and they just get matched with you because <laughs> once recently I told this story and then this one person next time, uh, he called his favorite, I don't know, call center. He said, why are you analyzing my personality? And the other person said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm also just emotions driven. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know how, how it went down, but the person on the other side, they don't know. Like, of course, now the idea is to, to get even more real-time uh, benefits out of it so the person uh, in the future and they're experimenting with that might get real-time feedback, right, on a monitor. That's often is not yet the case, but in the future they might get real-time feedback that basically tells them, all right, it's, it's time to give him the coupon. Like, now, give him the coupon. There's no, like, the red line's been crossed. Give him the coupon, get off the phone, right? That's how you can make. So, uh, of course, that's the idea, to, to get to assist people to better provide services. All right, this brings us to our last point, and there's already a lot of machine learning in here uh, in the previous example. It's these automated insights. So that's the idea of machine learning, of using artificial intelligence basically fight fire with fire, as I say. So this data delusion, this data flood that comes to us, this information overload, the only way we can make sense of it is by using the same digital tools that created it and in order to help us to weed through it and, and make sense of it. And it turns out that with little data, machine learning doesn't actually work very well. But with big data, machine learning works extremely well. And how these machines do it, they just look for patterns. That's basically the idea. So uh, big doesn't need to know why. So traditionally in artificial intelligence, what we always try to do is to implement these rules. For example, in language translation, right? They're grammatical rules. The words that relate to each other, they're grammatical rules. And you can really imagine now, same as you when you studied a foreign language in, in, in school, you learn the rules of grammar of these formal languages. Okay, uh, subject goes here, verb goes here, adjective goes here, then if you say this, it goes like this. Past tense, that's how you actually modify past tense, future tense. These are rules. And the idea was of machine translation always to feed the machine with these rules. Now the machine can remember much more rules than a high school student, so feed just all the rules in and then just translate just this as, uh, as we as we do in our lang second language learner textbooks. Now that never really worked. So these machine translation, uh, machine translation softwares never really did work. So at the time I worked at the United Nations, I, I speak five languages and I often worked in three languages. Uh, so I would work in three languages and translate back and forth between them. And I, I would try to use these machine uh, translation services, but they were really bad. You couldn't trust them until Google Translate came along. And I was still in the, at the end of my career before I retired there. Uh, and Google Translate came along. That was a big change because, honestly, I, I still use it nowadays. You, you, you translate a paragraph, maybe you have, to, you have to change a word. And that's not even the fault of the software. It's kind of like how you would like to say it a little bit better. They work. So machine translation is basically soft. How did Google uh, solve that? Well, they didn't teach the machines 
the rules, they just let the machine learn by just looking for patterns itself. So they went to the internet and looked for all different kinds of texts that have been translated from the same United Nation, which translates into five different languages, the European Union, which translates into many more languages, the Canadian government, which translates everything from English to French, French and all kinds of other uh, translations, not even official government translation, other translations from movies, books, and so forth that have been translated in different languages. They just fed it all to the machine and said to the machine, well, look for patterns, like why is this book like this translated here and like this translated here? What's, what's the relation? So the machine started to look for that and started to understand patterns. Patterns that if we look at the machine, what well, they might not make sense to us, but the form of the machine, it makes sense. And nowadays you can translate more than 100 languages on Google. Uh, and so for example, here, I actually, I translated from Esperanto to Swahili. I, I have a doubt if there's a person on planet Earth who speaks Esperanto and Swahili just because very few people speak Esperanto actually, uh, but Google. Google Translate can translate from Esperanto to Suahili, right? So it translates over different languages then, but these patterns are so stable, so it might translate to English and from there to the other language, but these patterns are so stable that it can actually translate, and it does actually work impressively well. And Google prided itself that while they developed these Google Translate services, there was no linguist involved. They actually made sure that no linguist enters the room while they developed that. It's a little arrogant, but that's what they say, because they wanted just the machine to discover these patterns all by itself, and they proved that it was actually uh, working. Now, it turns out that the, that was only possible because there was this massive digital footprint that they had where they could translate uh, train machines on. Another example here, you can actually see that if you do in Google uh, this recommendations, if you go to the Google search engine, you start typing, it starts to recommend you recommend you things already. If you train the machine, like you train the machine learning algorithm to make recommendations for that, if you train the machine with less than a million words, it doesn't really work. Only with a million, with 10 million, 100 million works, as you can see here in this graph, uh, the machine learning approach becomes better than the rules-based approach, where you actually make rules in, in order to, to teach you something. So with more data, the effectiveness of machine learning work. And while the promise of artificial intelligence has long been looming for 40, 50 years, only with the amount of data that artificial intelligence actually became practical, solving as important problems as machine translation, for example. Nowadays, applications of machine learning, the results of machine learning are all around us. They basically are the most important intermediators of digital information flow. For example, through something that is called recommender systems or recommender engines, such as the, the little engine that makes the recommendations of what to search for when you start typing into a search box of a search engine. Uh, or for example, when you are on social media, uh, you cannot see uh, the feeds and the postings of all of your friends, right? So there's a recommender engine that recommends to you and kind of like also discriminates, filters what are you seeing and what are you not seeing based on machine learning and that depends on how this algorithm actually was programmed. So they intermediate the informational overload uh, of the entire digital communication landscape basically. So let's go a little bit deeper into recommender systems and I want to show you two ways how you can do a recommender system, how you can think about that. So uh, the more traditional first way is basically content-based filtering. So that means I learn something about you and I make recommendations to you. It's kind of like you're a client who comes to my coffee shop all the time I know exactly how you like your coffee. Right, so I've been with, you've been my client for a long time, so I can know exactly know how you like your coffee, your drink, your food, and, and you be, you're regular, you're regular, and over regular time, over a long time in the past, I learned something about it. So how can we think about it? So here we have our database, and here we have different products, for example, and here we have one person, and over time, doesn't have to be on the same day, it can be over different days, weeks, years, this person interacts with different products. So for example, here we have a movie, a book, a soccer ball, and a skateboard on our retail side. 
And this person starts to like things, so starts to like the book and the soccer ball and doesn't like the movie and the skateboard, uh, then another indicator might be that the person spends a lot of time looking at the book very little time looking at the skateboard and it actually buys buys the soccer ball okay so yeah that's that that's a pretty clear sign the other one's also signed uh, then in the next uh, uh, next time step for example i don't know a week later or, or or later in the day the person then doesn't like the soccer ball even so it got purchased uh, and with the mouse it spends a lot of clicks, clicks actually around the books a lot. There's a click stream, the famous click stream, or even how you use your mouse, move your mouse like around, can can sometimes be monitored. Uh, and the click stream gives you a lot of information. You click around the books a lot, uh, and you dislike dislike the movie. So now the question is, what do we recommend to you? What do you think? Look at this pattern. What would you recommend to this client? The movie, the book, the soccer ball, or the skateboard? So that wasn't so difficult. The person obviously is almost about to buy the book, right? So you can make a special deal to, to do the book or even make the book more expensive. I mean, if the person is already about to buy it, you might as well raise the price. I mean, it's supply and demand. So if there's a lot of demand and supply, I can adjust my price to that. I mean, this person obviously will get the book, right? So all kinds of things, but you detect a pattern, a content-based filtering, a pattern over time. And nowadays, that is often used in many things. So this, this cartoon here, for example, says, your recent, um, this, this is somebody who is entering a country, uh, going going by, by the governmental officials by entering the country with immigration, and it says, your recent Amazon purchases uh, and Twitter score and location history makes you 23.5% welcome here. <laughs> so, well, wow, it's a, it's a little bit kind of like, you know, uh, since Edward Snowden, we know what's happening. And uh, uh, yes, so they basically have your trajectory from the past, uh, be it, Amazon purchases Twitter, P, uh, Twitter tweets and location history. And then you can calculate the store, how likely it is that you will purchase something or how likely it is that you, know, you treat a person uh, differently to some for, the, some other per, for, some, for some other purposes. Now, what you need there is time, right? Time is money, not in the sense that uh, you, you have to do things fast. No, you need a lot of history of a person. If you have a lot of history of this person, you know a lot about this person, you can make better recommendations. Same as if the regular goes to my coffee shop for many, many years, I know this person actually better. I know it doesn't want the coffee like this all the time, maybe sometimes like this. It depends on the weather maybe. So the more I know the person, the better I can make adjustments. I need a lot of time in order to do content-based filtering. Now, what's in a case that I have a new client, somebody I've never seen before? Can I give recommendation to that person even so I don't have a long history and time? I don't really know this person. Turns out, yes. Now, you don't need a lot of time for that. You need a lot of clients. That's called collaborative filtering, basically. Clients kind of like collaborate, they don't really, it's not like voluntarily they collaborate, but I have a lot of different clients, I understand the patterns among these different clients, and from there I infer to you, my new client that I've never seen before. But since you're also a human being, I would suggest that you act like most other human beings, right? So if I know a lot of other human beings, I can make suggestions to you. So how does that work? Let's look at that a little bit. So here again I have my four products, movies, uh, soccer balls, books, and, and, and skateboards. And this person seems to like movies and books and, and doesn't like, uh, not, he's not into sports, outdoor sports. It's more like a stay home, you know, movies and books guys, not, not, not soccer balls and skateboards, right? The second person uh, likes movies and books too uh, and doesn't like soccer balls either. Yeah, kind of like, yeah, a very similar kind of person, right, somehow. Uh, the other person, well, actually, well, this person likes a lot, likes movies uh, and likes soccer balls and, and skateboards, likes outdoor things, does not like book. This person doesn't like book. And now comes my fourth person, doesn't like books and likes skateboards. What recommendation should I make to this fourth person with regard to soccer balls and movies? Well, that's, that's, that's just right now here a hot mess, right? You cannot make sense of it. Okay, so let's, let's go a little bit more structured about it. Let's make our database. Okay, so let's do make our database again. Uh, we have now, here we don't have time. We have our four clients. We don't have a massive amount of time. We need a massive amount of clients. That we need a massive amount of people. And then we look for patterns not in time, but for patterns among people. 
So the first person, let's see if, if, if I got that right. Yeah, this person likes movies, likes books, doesn't like soccer balls, doesn't like skateboards. All right, good. This per the second person likes movies and books, doesn't like soccer balls. Right, got that right. Uh, the third person doesn't like books, likes everything else. Right. And the fourth person doesn't like books like skateboards. And, and the question was, now, okay, so what did you hear? Right. Now, is there a pattern? Do you see a pattern? Would you recommend a soccer ball to this person? Or would you not recommend a soccer ball to this person? Well, it looks like yes, right? Because there, there seem to be like two kind of people. The one who are more like the, the indoor kind of like movies and, and, and books and the other ones who are like uh, more the outdoorsy or the not outdoorsy, the soccer ball, the scale was right. They, the not outdoorsy are more up here and the other ones are down here. So if I, yes, it, it seems there's a pattern. It's not perfect. And big data is never completely complete. I, I have some holes in it. There are some exceptions, but kind of like on average, it seems reasonable that this person might like might like soccer because uh, everybody who who dislikes books and likes skateboards also like like soccer balls. And the other ones, the person who liked books and didn't like skateboards, didn't like soccer balls. So yeah, it kind of it kind of like fits in, right? What about the movie? How do you think you would recommend a movie or not? Well, it seems like here everybody likes movies. Right, so all right, so if everybody likes movies, everybody likes movies. So yeah, recommend the movie. Too. So that's the idea of collaborative filtering. So with a lot of, I mean, this is just a toy example, the value of Amazon is that Amazon has these millions and millions of clients and, and runs a lot of collaborative filtering. Now, of course, you can combine both, and that's what companies do, like Netflix, like Amazon, they combine content-based filtering, characteristics of the content, uh, they collected uh, your preferences about these characteristics over time, combined with collaborative filtering, right? And then build sophisticated algorithms that kind of like mix both of that. And the main drivers of these companies, like Netflix and Amazon, a main driver of their returns, it's making these predictive analytics, making these recommendations about what you might like, what movie you want like to uh, watch next, and what product you might buy. So this brings us back to our five characteristics of the four of veracity, variety, volume, velocity, or, or, or more concretely, uh, first of all, the digital footprint, right? So you leave this digital footprint behind. A data fusion, this digital footprint is always messy and incomplete, but kind of like I stitch it together with different complementary data sources. No sampling. Uh, I don't work with a limited sample. I just work with the entire population, with the entire universe. But this is also biased, can be biased, right? Um, it's in real time often, which has a lot of benefits, uh, especially comparative advantages to traditional methods of data collection, which are very slow. And machine learning, that actually without even understanding something like machine translation, natural language translation, the machine looks for patterns and can translate it. All right, so that basically answers our first question. So what is big data? I gave you five characteristics of what is big data. All right, good, so we did that. Um, what are the opportunities? I showed you a lot of opportunities uh, that go from real-time data management uh, up to collaborative filtering. There's a lot of uh, opportunities that can be exploited for companies and or for governments, for the civil society, and so forth. And then there are also some limitations or, or even threats. I mean, every, no technology is inherently good or bad. A technology is just a tool and can be used for the good or the bad. And there are some limitations, and that's what we have to go into now. That's, that's what, we're still, what we're still missing for today's lecture. I'm going to walk you through six limitations. doesn't mean that these are the only limitations. There are a lot of limitations. Uh, and, and things we have to be aware of and conscious of if you work with this digital footprint. But I'm going to work you about some of them, and some of them you've already seen in some of the examples before. For example, when we talked about political campaigns, right? There's, there, there are some downsides to it. But I want to go particularly to some limitations of using digital uh, using the digital footprint for social science purposes, for research purposes. So I go into these kind of like limitations. First of all, the limitation is that the footprint is not necessarily representative, and I already said that, right? We, said we try to work with the entire population of Facebook users, but Facebook users are Facebook users. They are not all people on planet Earth. Second of all, that the footprint is not the foot. 
it's a footprint. And, and we often confuse that, and that can have very dangerous consequences if we confuse that, confuse that. Third, there's meaning that we can detect in this data through artificial intelligence, through machine learning, but is that always meaningful as well? Is that really what we want? And we have to talk about that. Fourth, discrimination and personalization. Well, personalization, you already saw that from some examples I gave, is we personalize, but that also often sometimes means discriminate. So we have to think about that a little bit. Correlation is not equal to causation. Probably heard that. Uh, it's a very important aspect of it. And yeah, the past is not equal to the future. As intuitive and silly as that sounds, that's something very important because data is always from the past. All right, so first of all, the digital footprint and the representativeness. So if you work with the digital footprint, uh, the digital footprint, as you saw already in the Twitter example that I showed you when somebody says good morning on Twitter, we can only see that when we, where there is connectivity, where there is a footprint. If there's no footprint, digital footprint, it's not, it's not because there might not be a person, but it might be because there's no digital therefore no digital footprint. So this is called the digital divide, the divide between those that already have access and take advantage of digital technology and those that are, that are yet still excluded uh, from that uh, technology. Here, for example, we have a study from Josh Blumenstock from UC Berkeley. And what Josh here studied was mobile phone penetration in Rwanda in 2005. And what we find is that we compare here the subscriber data, that means people who have a mobile phone, and the survey data. It's kind of like our ground truth. That's actually how many people are there. And for example, in gender, we can see that in Rwanda, it's 50-50, like in most countries, 50% men, 50% women. However, with regard to mobile phone subscriber, there are many more men than women. That means our digital footprint is biased. Same as with age, for example. Middle um, is overly is overly represented here and with education as well people with higher education are actually overly represented with regard to illiterate people with very low education which at that time did not have access to a cell phone in Rwanda so the digital footprint in Rwanda is biased uh, in terms of who has access to the technology and that's what Josh uh, showed in the study a few years later, uh, another researcher did another study in Latin America, Frias Martinez, she did a study in Latin American economy 2009 with a mobile phone penetration uh, much higher. So in Rwanda, the mobile phone penetration was at 2 to 20%, below 20%. And here the mobile phone penetration was between 16 and 80%. So up to eight out of 10 people had a mobile phone. And you can see now here the representativeness is extremely good. So 50% men, 50% women in the, in, in, the, in the census data, and also 50% men and 50% women in the, uh, have a mobile phone. Same as with age, uh, same with income. So the income, these two now, they look very similar, right? So the different income groups are well represented in the digital footprint, in the mobile phone footprint, uh, in contrast to Rwanda, where this is not the case, where we have a very biased digital footprint. So that might give you to the conclude, might get you to lead you to the conclusion to say, all right, so once everybody is connected, and that's just a question of time, uh, everybody has a mobile phone. We actually in this world already, we have more mobile phones than we have people. Well, some people have two mobile phones, so, so not every, but almost everybody, even in the poorest countries, they have a mobile phone, even if there's no technology often. Even in places where there's no landline electricity, for example, they often have mobile phones, charging them on some solar panels uh, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, so you might get to the conclusion, all right, so once everybody is connected, the digital footprint is representative. Uh, not so fast. There's, there's one problem still, and that's that the digital footprint, actually the, the digital divide, has evolved over time. And this evolution of the digital divide is actually due to the fact that our access technology to the digital realm has evolved. So back in the, in the 80s, we only basically had one uh, technology to access, even digital communication. The fixed, line, the fixed line phone was often digital already back then, and each fixed line phone has the same bandwidth. Yeah, you could talk through it, and that's what you could do through it. So if in a country you wanted more access 
to the digital realm, you just would buy more uh, fixed line phones, right? And that's what you would see here. So here on the horizontal x-axis is the number of fixed line phones of, of, of subscriptions per capita. And here is the bandwidth. And you see a one-to-one -one relationship, right? It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Some countries have more bandwidth because you know, they have more phones. Now, over time, this evolved and it's actually now a two-dimensional challenge because you can have more subscriptions, but they're, they're not only fixed line phones, they are mobile phones, uh, there's broadband, there's narrowband, there's broadband internet, there are different levels of connectivity. And we see some countries that have a lot of bandwidth available, for example, some Asian countries. Korea, for example, we can see here, uh, up here, South Korea has a lot of connectivity. And the number of subscriptions per capita, actually how many devices we have, doesn't actually increase. It's more like it increases while well, we all have one subscription, like until like two subscriptions, so we all have a fixed and a mobile device. Then it's almost like we hit a wall, right? And then we go straight up, and then the divide keeps, off, keeps on evolving, not by having more technology. Some people have more bandwidth. So even when we all have a phone, some people will be overrepresented in the digital in the digital realm because they have more bandwidth right so even if everybody has a smartphone some people will have little holograms on their hands and when everybody has holograms in their hands some people have brain computer interface what do i know but it, it keeps on evolving right so uh, there is a difference of over representation of some people simply because some people have more bandwidth even so that if everybody so the digital divide is not closed when everybody has, has access to a technology. Now the problem with that is that the bandwidth device is incredibly persistent. It's not, e it's not easy to get rid of and that's because it's related to the level of income. And income levels are notoriously persistence, in, 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 income inequality. So here what it is, the same graph, uh, and now I put a third dimension to it, which is the income dimension, which you see here like coming, coming outwards, that's the income that's available in a country. And you can see here that even poor countries, countries with no income at all, very poor countries, they're kind of like against the wall, right? They don't have any income. They can still still move up and move up and actually on the axis of subscription so they can buy mobile phones. They cannot buy a lot of bandwidth because they're poor, but they can buy mobile phones. They have a lot of mobile phones with not a lot of connectivity, but mobile phones. And you can see kind of, kind of like they go along this axis and then once they hit like 1.52 subscriptions per capita, they keep on going up because if we all have two devices, a fixed and a mobile, we don't we don't need more, but then we keep on going up with getting more bandwidth. And you can see that the countries with more income have a lot more bandwidth. So actually, the, the bandwidth divide is very related to the income divide. And the income divide, the income inequality, is notoriously persistent. We're not going to change that anytime soon. There's richer countries, richer people, poorer people. And those with more income, they will be overrepresented in the digital footprint because they have more bandwidth. So it's not so easy to say that, I've, I've told, walked you through all of that because often the suspicion is, oh, making the digital footprint representative, just, we just have to wait until everybody is connected, but no, everybody will not, in the, at least as far as we can see, never be equally connected. Some people will have more access and some people will have, will have less access. Uh, for those of you who, who are familiar with the discussion of net neutrality, that's a very important discussion that fits in here because it's also the question of who is overrepresented, who is underrepresented in the digital realm. So that makes the digital footprint always still biased. The next limitation is that the footprint is not the foot. But it is so crystal clear, right? We can see it so crystal clear in real time. It's almost like we have a crystal ball. And you can see that if you go to Silicon Valley, people will try to sell you a crystal ball, right? And it's very tempting. I mean, it's a crystal ball. You can predict the future. So with such granularity, see everything. And yeah, and it, it's very tempting. And, and being impressed by this uh, amount of accuracy, we can predict things with 80, 85% accuracy, 90% accuracy. You know, we might confuse the footprint with the foot. And that's also, usually it's fine 
for example, you know, you can make some mistakes and Amazon sends you a wrong commercial and you can laugh about it sometimes. But if it goes to more serious questions, if you use the digital footprint for more serious questions, well, then we run into limitations. For example, uh, predictive policing is a big field where they use it. So when, when, when police cars go on their patrols, nowadays often in many cities here in California, they're guided by algorithms. These algorithms for predictive policing actually tell the police where to go. They actually use algorithms that are again uh, taken from, from another field, in this case from earthquakes. Because just like an earthquake is a big earthquake and they're little replicas of the earthquake, often crimes happen like this, right? So the earthquake algorithms turn out to be very useful there. And, uh, and a lot of data goes in there. Who drives where? What's the bus schedule? Uh, where do people move? Right? And, and that gives suggestions to the police uh, to make some rounds in some neighborhoods at some points. And effectively, we could measure crimes got reduced with this predictive policing, with police following the recommendations of an algorithm of where to show up at which time. Um, so th that's called predictive policing. And we can use predictive policing in, in a lot of these kind of uh, applications, in, in police, in the judicial system. For example, if somebody got convicted for homicide, right, a murderer, and, and got behind bars, got into prison, the question after a few years is, does this person get parole? Can this person get out of prison? In a prison, you have a lot of data. I mean, you can monitor these people behind bars 24-7 with video cameras, uh, with other records, behavioral records. And so imagine you take all of this data, you analyze it, and then you can make a prediction of what's the likelihood that this convicted murderer gets re-involved into another homicide after being released from prison. And this uh, algorithm tells you with 70% accuracy, with 70% probability, this person will be re-involved in another homicide. Now, do you give this person parole or not? Well, has this person done anything? No. Now, has this person already committed a second murder? No. I mean, this person did a first murder, but the second one with the parole, uh, I mean, no, the person did not, re but the algorithm says 70%. Pr so you want to let this person go and, and another person's going to die? Or you better lock a person up, but then the person didn't do it. So how do we do that nowadays? Well, we go to a psychologist and the psychologist says, well, there's a 70% and uses this processor here, uses the brain and evaluates with this processor. Uh, and, and we've been fine with that for decades. And now algorithms make these predictions. Somehow it makes us feel kind of like funny, right? An algorithm saying, oh, it's 70% probably, that's why you're going to get locked up because an algorithm said it. But that actually happens already all around us. For example, um, if you're young, if you're in your 20s and you have a sports car and you're male, you might pay more car insurance than somebody, I don't know, a mother of two in, in her mid-30s, which the car insurance company might think, well, this mother will drive more careful than this 20 guy with a sports car. So the mother of two with two kids will drive more careful, has to pay. But that's also kind of like prediction, like nothing happened yet. It might be that you are a much more careful driver, but you have to pay more insurance premiums. So there's kind of like predictive discrimination that happens already. Uh, and, and we're actually used to it. Now, in some cases, it becomes even even more delicate. For example, if we take the ultimate decision, and that is to kill somebody. All right, so, for example, with drones, what drones do uh, in drones applied in warfare is, well, the drones basically what they, what they shoot at, what they kill is mobile phones. So people carry mobile phones around, and then we have the SIM card, and we go after the SIM card, and we see, well, there's a person, and the drones basically, for example, I mean, there are other data footprints as well. We do data fusion, but the mobile phone is very important. And many terrorists then started to play Russian roulette. So basically, they exchange the SIM card with others, also with innocent or so forth, in order to distract. And there's a lot of collateral damage. I mean, there's a lot of innocent people dying before we get a terrorist. You can look up the statistics um, on that. So because, well, we go for the footprint. We, we don't really see the foot. So as one JSOC drone operator says, it's of course assumed that the phone belongs to a human being who is nefarious and considered an unlawful enemy combatant. Or 
as the former director of the NSA and CIA says, we kill people based on metadata. Metadata, that's data about data, right? Or to say it again in the words of the JSOC drone operator, well, this is where it gets very shady. Another limitation of working with uh, big data is that we try to derive meaning from this data, but the meaning is not always meaningful, or at least it's not what we want to be in the future. Let me, let me walk through an example. For example, we take all text corpora that we have uh, on the internet. You, you see all the text that you find on the internet, and you feed it into an artificial intelligence, and what it actually does then with applications like word to vec so it takes these words and converts it into vectors and creates this multidimensional vector space. Where, okay, well, nobody can imagine beyond three dimensions, but just imagine a three-dimensional space now where you have words in different corners of the space that kind of like cluster together because they co-occur together and have something to do with each other. Right? And then in order to derive meaning, we just see like what kind of words hang together. So for example, let's feed all the text we find on our social media, on newspapers, on Wikipedia and so forth, encyclopedias. We feed it into our uh, word to vector artificial intelligence. And then we see their names like male names, John, Paul, Mike, Kevin, Bill, and female names, Amy, Lisa, Sarah, Diana, and Anne. And we see where in this vector space they are and what other words are in the vicinity of, of, of these words. What we, when we do that, what we find is male names are in the vicinity of other words like executive, management, professional, corporation, salary, office, business, office, business, career. Female names like Amy, Lisa, Sarah, and so forth are in the vicinity of, of words like home, parents, children, family, marriage, wedding, relative, which is funny because Per biological de definition, there are as many male parents as female parents, right? Uh, so it's it's funny that you, you know, yeah. So why would? Well, that's what the algorithm detects. So where where does the algorithm get things like that from? The algorithm is really discriminatory. It discriminates against women. It's not. It's not. Where does the algorithm get that from? Let's look at another example. So here's an example where we take names predominantly used by an ethnic origin, uh, a white ethnic origin. For example, Harry, Katie, Jonathan, Nancy, and Emily. And we see these names are in the vicinity of words like freedom, health, love, peace, heaven, gently, lucky, loyal, diploma, laughter, and vacation. And when we take names predominantly used by African Americans, Jerome, Ebony, Jasmine, Latisha, Tia, we see they are in the vicinity of other words words used to abuse, filth, sickness, accident, poison, assault, poverty, evil, agony, prison. So again, that's really a racist artificial intelligence, right? Where does this artificial intelligence get such racist statement that somebody called Jerome, Ebony, Jasmine, Tisha, or Tia is, is more likely to go to prison? So for example, if we would now use this artificial intelligence to invite for a job interview. And we would ask this artificial intelligence, who should we invite for a job interview? The artificial intelligence says, well, don't invite anybody with these names because they are more likely to go to prison. So, and it actually has been shown that if you would use that, the probability that you will get invited to a job interview just by having this name after consulting this kind of artificial intelligence is only 66% compared with people with other uh, first names who have a higher probability the artificial intelligence would recommend them because, you know, professional love, uh, laughter and happiness in, 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 in contrast to sickness, accident and prison. So where again, again, I asked for the third, where does the artificial intelligence get that from? How can an artificial intelligence be so racist, so discriminatory in terms of gender? Where does it get it from? You're right, it gets it from us. It gets it from us. We just fed it with the big data, with the digital footprint of us. We are as racist, we are as discriminatory uh, with regard to women. And 
everything we leave behind in our social media and our books and our newspaper articles and our encyclopedias, we fit that in our different intelligence and now we can see that. All, all, all the difference is now you can really just actually visually see it in a vector space. And that brings us to our next point, and that is actually discrimination, right? So discrimination and, and kind of like personalization, which goes together because here as well, we made in this previous example, we had a personalized recommendation who to invite to a job interview. And we can even drive this further. For example, when you go online shopping, for example, on a travel online search engine or a travel agency, online agency, uh, we see price discrimination. So it might be that you and me search for the same place, but you and me are offered different prices. Now, from a point of view of economic efficiency and effectiveness, that's actually an agreement with economic uh, theory, right? Supply and demand adjust, and supply and demand, if they adjust on the individual level, it's called third, third degree price discrimination. That's actually optimal for economic efficiency, but it still feels like, why do you pay more than me? Often it's also more subtle. It's not that the prices are really different, it's just the order is different. So they would recommend me a different hotel than they would recommend to you, than they would recommend another. So the order of hotels is different different, which is because of personalization. Okay, so personalization, yes, they know the kinds of hotels I want, they know the kinds of hotels you like from content-based and collaborative filtering, but it feels like discrimination as well. We kind of like just get discriminated here, right? There, there are many studies and a growing body of studies that actually shows how unintentional this discrimination actually comes about when we use these machine learning algorithms in order to make decisions. For example, uh, you probably took the SAT when you, before you came to college and the Princeton uh, review of online SAT tutoring packages, it turns out it has a price difference it costs between $6,600 and $8,400, this SAT tutoring package, depending on the zip code. And if you ask Princeton SAT review, what they say is, well, the Princeton review says pricing is based on the cost of running our business. So yes, in some neighborhoods it might be more expensive, than in other neighborhoods uh, to run their business and the competitive attributes of the given market. So if it's very competitive, not competitive, and that also makes sense. Yes, San Francisco is more expensive than other places and, and, and within Los Angeles, there's some neighborhoods that are more expensive uh, than others. So yes, it makes sense. You adjust your price. It's not, it's not like everything costs the same everywhere. It's, it's price of supply and demand people have money, people don't. So, but what turned out then by doing that, what people found is that Asians are more likely to be among those charged higher prices by the Princeton Review. Now, why might that be? Now, the Princeton Review says we didn't sort out Asians in order to charge them higher. Well, that would be against, that would be ethnic discrimination, right? Racial discrimination. So why, why, why is that? Why do you think that happened? Well, the explanation is right here on the sheet. It says Asians make up to about 5% of the US population overall, but they account for more than 8% of the population in areas where the Princeton uh, Review charges higher prices for their SAT packages. So actually what happens is that Asians just happen to live in more expensive areas, but then if you look at the other way around, it turns out that Asians pay more well. Do they discriminate against Asians? No, it was unintentional. They discriminate according to zip codes, but Asians happen to live in these zip codes, but then it turns out you discriminate against Asians, don't you? Do you? How could you prove it? And that's a very contentious issue to say in the words as two researchers because you have this disparate impact and the data analysis. And by definition, data mining is always a form of statistical and therefore seemingly rational discrimination. That's what data mining does. Indeed, the very point of data mining is to provide a rational basis upon which to distinguish between individuals and to reliably confer to the individuals the qualities possessed by those who seem statistically similar. That's what we did, for example, in collaborative filtering. So the idea is always to look for similarities and differences. So data analysis is you look for differences. Data discriminates. 
you look how you can put people in different boxes. And when you put people in different boxes, you discriminate. So data analysis is inherently, is inherently that. And this can have these kind of unintended consequences. Now, the good news is I go, gave you a couple of examples now of how artificial intelligence actually could be racist, discriminate against race, or have this unintended consequences here just because we either feed it biased data or data is biased on some other aspects which leads to a discrimination. The good news is that we can work on that. And uh, even better news is that it's much easier to change an algorithm than to change a human brain. Because we know we all have these prejudices, right? We're all uh, biased. We have all stereotypes, evolutionary-wise, that had a very important role. Stereotypes help us to take decisions quickly that protect us. Potentially wrong, but better safe than sorry. So evolutionary-wise, stereotypes had a very important role in that and still have, but we cannot get them out of our minds. So even if you go, I don't know, you go on to be on the Supreme Court and you have 40 years of training as a judge to be completely impartial, we have proven in studies and studies that you will still not be impartial. You will still be biased. You will still have prejudices, stereotypes, and so forth. We cannot get them out of this information processor. However, in algorithms, this is a very a very growing and blooming and very active field of research. Can we train algorithms that are still accurate, that still discriminate, that still put people in boxes so we can make predictions, but don't discriminate against the few things that are protected by our constitutions, by our laws? For example, if you know that what is protected by law is gender equality, race, and, 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 and ethnicity and religion, for example, you can take these three or four variables and make sure that while you make your machine learning algorithm, for example, a decision tree or whatever you want, want to do, that in this machine learning algorithm, that these variables are not discriminated against. Now you lose some information because more data, you can make better predictions. So these variables you don't want to use. You actually want to make sure that they're equally represented in the outcome. So you lose accuracy. Now, from a computer science or statistical perspective, from a data analytics perspective, oh, you lose accuracy, that's horrible. But it has been shown that actually you have to lose very little accuracy. So instead of having accuracy of 90%, you can have 89.5%. Uh, so you lose very little accuracy, but then the outcome is you can completely eradicate any bias. So if you would use an adjusted algorithm in order to ask who to invite to a job interview, it will still make extremely good predictions. And these variables that you predefine, gender, uh, race, and, and religion, for example, will be equally then represented in your job interviews. You can guarantee for that. No human research manager can guarantee for that because we can just not handle this data and our prejudices will creep in, intentionally or unintentionally. Right, so that's actually the good news in a very blooming uh, field of research of how you can make algorithms that discriminate, learn some aspects, discriminate among them, who are the beneficial clients, who are the good co uh, job candidates, who are not, but does not discriminate among others, which are, which are things that we want to have protected, that we do not want to discriminate against. And that brings us to another limitation of, of, of big data. Uh, that often creates a lot of confusion, but it also has actually a pretty straightforward data science solution. So if you do your data science well, then you can deal with it. But it's a limitation that is often not considered in practice and leads to a lot of damage in, in applying uh, big data analytics. And that is that correlation is not causation. And this is something very common. So correlation basically means that two things go together in causation means that one thing causes the other. So correlation might be both things go up together, or one thing goes up, one thing goes down, or both things go down. And causation means that if this goes up, then it makes this go up as well. So actually there's a relation, but you know, correlation itself doesn't really show that there's a causation between them. And this confusion is really is omnipresent. I, I just turn on the TV 
sometimes they cannot stand it anymore. I mean, with these these TV reporters with all these graphs nowadays, and they they t- take out conclusions which are completely not substantiated because it's based on a correlation. For example, even in the highest uh, ranks of government, this is uh, an internal White House document of the Trump administration from 2017, and the internal White House document alleges that manufacturing decline. That means that there are less people in the United States working in manufacturing jobs, such as you know, manufacturing cars, increases abortions, infertility, and spousal abuse. R- right? So it means that there, there are less people working in the manufacturing sector. They might not work in another sector. I mean, they don't even have to be unemployed, but less working in the manufacturing sector. They might work now in the service industry or something. But no. And that leads to more abortions, more infertility. Absolutely, there's nothing that could hold this. And this slide is actually from the Trump administration that was shown in the White House. Uh, There's absolutely no evidence for that. It might be that in some parts of the country they go together, but it's not that the manufacturing decline increases the other one. It might also be the other way around. It might be that there are what we call spurious correlations or confounding variables. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. So basically, correlation and causation, uh, you can find a lot of correlations among a lot of things. For example, the correlation I found here uh, is a very strong correlation of, of, of 97, a correlation of 97 out of 100. So, and it shows that the number of civil engineering doctorates correlates almost perfectly with the consumption of cheese. And that's also cool as long as you want to make predictions. So, if, 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 as long as this holds, as long as this is this, it stays the same, if you want to predict the number of civil engineering doctorates, you can use the the consumption of cheese. Because if that's a stable correlation, you can make predictions. What you cannot do is claim making claims of causality, because if you would intervene then, for example, uh, so and say like, oh, well, how can we get more uh, civil engineering doctorates? Well, guys, we got to eat more cheese. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing will happen. <laughs> Obviously, nothing will happen there, right? Because there is no causation. There's a correlation, but there might be a spurious correlation. So here, for example, I found a very nice example that the number of movies that the actor Nicolas Cage participated in almost perfectly correlates with deaths by people being hit by sports equipment. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, somebody, somebody tell this guy to stop making movies. I mean, that's not a question of taste anymore. That's a question of, of pu- it's a public health issue, right? But yeah, again, that's a correlation causation issue, right? Uh, and where does that actually come from? Well, it comes from here, and I want to walk you a little bit more in detail detail through that. And uh, imagine this kind of correlation, which is a correlation that really holds. I mean, they're absolutely statistically this holds. That's why Mark Twain used to say there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are damned lies, and there are statistics. <laughs> so you can make these kind of lies with statistics because this is a really strong correlation. It says that the size of the shoes of children between 2 and 18 years almost perfectly correlates with the time they spend on the Internet. So kids between 2 and 18 years with bigger shoes spend more time on the Internet, which means, guys, which obviously means if we want to increase digital literacy of our children, we got to make their feet grow. Or at least we got to buy them bigger shoes. That might be a cheaper solution. And honestly, as ridiculous as that sounds, I turn on the TV, I hear these kind of things all the time in every kind of, every kind of news channel. That's the kind of conclusion that people draw all the time because they confound uh, correlation with causation. So why is that here? Well, there is a confounding variable. That's a spurious correlation. This confounding variable leads to a spurious correlation. What is the confounding variable? What variable have we not considered in this example? Right, it's the age. We just threw all the children together from 2 to 18. Obviously, the ones who are 18 have bigger shoes and they use the internet more than, than, than toddlers with two of little tiny feet but don't use the internet. If you would control for age, 
like taking all two-year-olds or taking all 18-year-olds, you don't find any correlation between shoe size and internet usage. Right? So that's the spurious correlation, the confounding variable. Now, you can control for that statistically. There are some techniques. Also, how you collect data, and especially with the digital footprint that also gives a lot of time series data, you can control for causality much better than we could ever before. We still don't do it because it's a little bit more labor intensive. You need a little bit more sophisticated techniques. How you collect your data is a little bit more sophisticated, but you can actually detect causality with more and better data. And that's what the digital footprint big data is all about. So actually, there are a lot of opportunities. We just don't do it really. So that's we really have to consider that and distinguish that. And then the last part. Uh, you might have heard me talking about this before. It's, it's the idea that big data cannot tell us anything about changing futures. And that has to do with a big discussion, which was a big discussion uh, a few years back, that some people said that big data machine learning especially leads to the end of theory, right? So how was it traditionally when we did scientific theory, if we try to discover something? So here we have one of the biggest scientific theoreticians we ever had, uh, Newton. So here we have Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton answered the question, for example, a question like, how often is there full moon? He answered the question by setting up a comprehensive theory with his differential equations. And that's actually the equation that predicts you how often is full moon. So the moon goes around the Earth, and the Earth goes around the sun. And then you can calculate how often there actually is, uh, is full moon. So he had a theory behind that, and that's the theory. What would a big data analyst do? Well, a big data analyst doesn't care about theory at all. Just like the Google Translate people, they didn't uh, ask about linguists about the theory behind language. They basically just correlated data. So a big data scientist would just go, for example, to Google search and look up, when do people Google full moon? And you can see it's perfect periods of 29 days, days between the peaks. And with the digital footprint, you don't need anything. You don't need Newton with all these differential equations. You just look it up. The digital footprint gives you perfect predictions of when it's going to be full moon. Well, that's when people Google full moon. So there doesn't need to be any theory. And these kind of claims let people like uh, Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired, uh, that's a big tech magazine, used to say, well, Google conquered the advertising world with nothing more than applied mathematics. It didn't pretend to know anything about the culture and conventions of advertising. Just assumed that better data with better analytical tools would win the day. And Google was right. Google's founding philosophy is that we don't know why this page is better than that one in Google search recommendations. If the statistics of incoming links say so, that's good enough. So Google, without any theory, is able to make predictions. Same with what it did with Google Translate. The same, for example, about your personality. Uh, Google knows your personality, your psychology better than any psychologist without having any psychological training or psychological theory, just by your behavioral data. As long, and that's a very important as long, as long as your behavior stays the same, as long as your personality stays the same. If you might fall in love, change your job, change the country, and your behavior change changes abruptly, Past data cannot predict anymore your future behavior. Your past, because your past behavior and your future behavior is different. Now a psychologist who has a theory can still be able to make predictions. Same as Newton's theory here, because he knows all the variables that are actually involved. He knows what causes why and how this hangs together. So he can say, well, if you change your job to this kind of job or you change to move to this country, that's how your behavior is likely to change because he has a theoretical understanding of the background. And that's very important in big data. It leads us to the question of stationarity. The technical term is stationarity. So if your behavior is stationary, kind of like if the overall statistics of your behavior kind of like stay the same, then you can predict the future. If not, well, then you cannot, right? So, and this has some pitfalls. For example, uh, there's a very famous example of the Google flu trend. So Google flu trend basically used Google searches in order to predict the flu in the United States. 
And basically what they did is they used the 15 million most common search terms to predict the spread of the seasonal flu. They don't even have to be related to the flu. They just saw which of the 15 million most common search terms are related to the flu. They didn't handpick them with any theory. They just looked statistically which are correlated. Run a bunch of models and then they identified 45 search terms that I actually could be able to predict the outbreak of the, flu, of the flu. Extremely useful. Much better than the government data because government data, they get that from hospitals when people actually go to hospitals because they already have the flu and until it's all processed and then three months later, well, we already we already lost, right? So this in real time could give you flu prediction and it worked perfectly well. As you can see, that's applied to another case of dengue, uh, a, very, a, a very serious disease. So it helped us a lot to understand that better. Now, a few Few years later, some other scientists wanted to replicate it, so they took this algorithm and tried to the flu algorithm and tried to try to predict uh, the flu, and it didn't work at all. It did not work at all anymore. What happened? What do you think? Wh what happened? Why did the algorithm not work anymore? Well, what happened is that the behavior of the people changed. People just Google different things. Is these 45 search terms were not any more correct because there was no theory behind these 45 search terms. It's not like these search terms had to do necessarily with the flu. There might have been spurious correlations. There might have been confounding variables with it. And, and over the years, people started to search different things. Other things were correlated with it. And as a result, uh, it, didn't, it, it wasn't able to make predictions anymore because the pattern is non-stationary, right? The behavior just changed. And if behavior just changed, there's nothing you can say. To make it a little bit more, more abstract, uh, if you have, for example, a data series that kind of like looks like this, and you have this data series now, now going like this, how do you think, what's your prediction? How will this data pattern continue? What do you think? And there is nothing, nothing in the data that would allow you to predict differently than continue as was. Because everything in that data that this data tells you forces you to predict like, well, that's actually, it has to continue like this. There's nothing in the data that would allow you to do otherwise. Now, this data from the past would not allow you to make a prediction, for example, like this. Like there's nothing in this past that would uh, predict that. If you would have a theory, in theory, yes, you could do that. In theory, you could say, well, oh, something changes there, then not the data. The data is necessarily always from the past because as soon as you record it, it, it passed. Uh, in theory, you can then, if you have a theoretical framework, you can make predictions about futures that, that didn't exist before. And we do that as well, and that's then a complement. So a final limitation of big data is complemented by another computational social science technique, which is computer simulations, which is kind of like playing SimCity. So um, here, that's a SimCity simulation. What I did here in the simulation is create a future that did not exist before. So this is sustainable, sustainable uh, city, which can be calibrated with big data. I mean, creating the city, you calibrate it with real cities that exist. But eventually, you grow cities that don't exist in data, different cities. You want to make the world a better place. You want to have a world without pollution, without poverty. In order to make the world a better place, we can then simulate futures that never existed. So for example, these here are real world simulations. That's a simulation here from the United States military in Afghanistan uh, to simulate where people are walking uh, or insurgents or, or terrorist attacks might happen. This is a chemical attack in Los Angeles that never happened. We don't have data. We have data that can calibrate our model. We have data about Los Angeles. We have data about how people move. We have data about chemical attacks. But to see what had happened in Los Angeles, we have to simulate something that never existed. And this here is traffic in Chicago. So actually in social sciences, we are always changing what's happening. So social systems are, are necessarily unstationary because we have this desire in the social sciences to make the world a better place. And this is actually a critique from a Nobel Prize winner in economics uh, Robert Lucas, it's called the Lucas Critique. So Lucas critiqued his colleagues in econometrics, that's kind of like the data science of economics, uh, and, and he critiqued them and he said, so you guys are studying some economic dynamic 
and you run your correlations and so forth. And then you discover that something's wrong, so you make a policy that's supposed to change the system. But then you still think to predict the future with the past that existed before, and that just doesn't work. I mean, once you ch intervene and change the system, the system will be a completely different system. You don't have data about it, so econometrics alone cannot help you there. Literally said, any change in policy, that means intervention, will systematically alter the structure of the econometric model. And in social science, since we always want to improve the world, we always destroy the stationary, we always destroy the insights that we just gained. So social science is extremely complex to actually do, and thankfully we need one method is not enough. Empirical work is not enough. We need theoretical work to complement it. That's the ultimate limitation of big data. All right, that brings us to the three questions we had today. We had, what is big data? And I gave you five characteristics of big data. I want you to walk you through a bunch of opportunities uh, with hopefully more or less entertaining case studies from governments uh, and from companies. And lastly, I walked you through six limitations that this big data paradigm also has. It's very important to understand these limitations in order not to completely go with excitement and turn into a hype. It's a very powerful way of doing social science. The digital footprint gives us unprecedented opportunities, but as always, there are some limitations. I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I did. See you next time.